So guys, great to have you on here. This is the Team Super Dad Expert Hangout. Uh, we've been doing this for a while now, and it was my way to bring together experts on a particular subject. You know, inside of Team Super Dad, um, we're, we're a community of dads, dads who want more, to be more, to make more, to play more. And, you know, I have this F5, it's called the F5, and that's focus, fitness, finance, family, and fun. And you know, these are really key areas for for dads. You know, some some of us are smashing it at work, but uh, but but are divorced. Others are fit as, as as a fiddle, but but absolutely skin. And uh, it was my experience after my after my breakup and, and and stuff like that. I was like, surely, like, I could fix this. <laughs> like, and then yeah. it dawned on me all the people that I'd ever met, all the coaches, all the courses, all the all the experts, I was like, do you know what? This isn't so hard. We just got to put it together and, and, and make it available to people in a way that they can make some basic adjustments in their life um, and absolutely, you know, and, and, and actually move forward and, and, and improve themselves. And, and for me, as, 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 as obviously as a man myself and as a dad, you know, I see out there in the world, lots of guys working hard and just feeling like, uh, just like <laughs> under the pressure, unappreciated and, uh, and I don't, I, that's, that's that's my mission in the world is is to equip dads to have uh, is to have that to live a bold life basically. Fantastic. And I love having it. you on tonight is is an absolute pleasure. Um, I've been looking at doing a money, uh, an expert hangout around money, and you know we we've all met through the KPI uh, Key Person of Influence program, which is a fabulous community as well as a program. Um, um, uh, fronted by by Daniel Priestley and his organization Dent. So if anybody's interested in how you can become a key person of influence or or be confidently on a on a on a conversation like this, then then definitely uh, have a look at Dan's key person of influence book and the, and the key person of influence program. And it was as answering a, a question in in that group that I got introduced to David and to Jason. And I'll let you guys do your do your own little intro. Uh, but you know, two two guys because I've, I've I've read your websites and listened to your podcasts and seen seen what you're up to and it's just really awesome to have you know um, without you, you can introduce yourself and I don't want to do a miss justice but you know, it seems that Jason you're you're much more focused around the the personal wealth uh, and David you've got this absolute abundance of experience around business finance and raising capital and you know the the essence of this evening's um, expert hangout is about it's about having it all I said it to start with but some guys will have plenty of money, but are so focused on saving it and making it work hard for them that they forget about the having fun part. And then you've got yeah. other dads who've perhaps a little bit too frivolous with their money or never really had enough education around money management. Um, clearly, we don't really get that at school. But so they just find it hard, they're, whether they're in debt or whether they've got lots of money but not got any cash. You know, that's a big challenge for people. I'm really rich and really skinny at the same time. <laughs> I speak to dads in, in that boat and I, and I know you two do as well. So, you know, that's if people are tuning in now at the start of this of this expert hangout, that's really what we're going to going to work through tonight. And the value of, of, of the expert hangout. I already know I'm going to invite you guys onto the podcast so we can dig more into your story. But the value of the expert hangout is that we can, you know, we can blast through through a number of different subjects and really get some a, a mixture of, of, of advice and guidance and tips um, um, from Jason and David's perspective on on just the subject of money having enough of it and having some fun with it so uh, without further ado I'll, I'll hand over to uh, David you're on the top of my screen if you want to give yourself a, a little introduction to people and then sure okay um, so so my name is David Horn um, I run a business called Ad then multiply um, I run another business called Funding Focus, which I'll come on to. Uh, but basically, so I, I trained as a chartered accountant with PwC. I worked internationally and spent the first 10 years of my career working in blue chip corporates in kind of a traditional corporate kind of role. And then in the year 2000, I entered the world of entrepreneurship and that just completely changed everything for me. And over the course of the, the first decade of the, the new millennium, I worked in three different um, businesses that were in all very different in different industries. One was a PR agency, one was a digital media and publishing business, one was an auctioning business, but they all had one thing in common and that was that they raised money and bought other companies. And that just created a, a perspective for me that was 
kind of game changing. And, and really interestingly, when I look back on my life, I actually had a moment when I was 14 years old. Um, I, gr I grew up in Canada, hence the accent. Um, but um, when I was 14, it was the summer of 1976 and Canada was running the summer Olympics in Montreal. Yeah. And I was into coin collecting. And so there, how was old a, you? there was a, there was a, there how was old a, you? sorry. How old were you at this time? 14. Right, right, right. And there was a, um, a coin collection or a coin set, a special coin set for the Olympics that the Royal Canadian Mint came out with. And it was, it was $300. And I had $100 saved up. I had a, a newspaper round as a kid and I had $100 saved up. And I remember chatting with my dad and saying it was so unfair. I couldn't get this set. I wanted it, blah, blah, blah. And my dad said, well, let's go downtown and meet my bank manager. I'm 14, right? So we go down and meet my dad's bank manager and I explain to him that I'm into coin collecting. I've got a newspaper around. I've got this kind of income coming in. I've saved up $100, but I need $300 to buy this coin set. So the bank manager listens to the story and then he pulls out a bunch of forms and we sign the forms. And of course, my dad countersigns them for the guarantee. And bang, I had, a hundred, I had $300 in my bank account and I bought that coin set. And over the next two years, I paid $10 into my bank account from my newspaper earnings and made sure I could pay off the loan. And in two years time, that loan was paid off. And the crazy thing was at the age of 16, I had a credit rating. <laughs> I'm now 57 years old. I still have that coin set today. Nice. That is a proper Mary Poppins, Jane and Michael Banks. That is. <laughs> <laughs> And that was where that's where that was, that, that was my first experience with fundraising and acquisitions. Yeah. Well, kudos to your dad for uh, for making Absolutely. that happen. Absolutely, definitely. And uh, wow, and that's that's like ripple effect, isn't it? That, that's the amazing thing of 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 being a parent and and part of the legacy um, that I believe we all have the opportunity to to, to create as as dads is Absolutely. you know generationally. Uh, I feel that dads today are, are have a greater opportunity than ever before to provide that for their children. Um, uh, what that looks like is down to the individual. But oh, uh, I, at a basic level, I talk to my kids a lot more than my dad talked to me. And that's no discredit yeah. to my dad. He said, well, my dad never told me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but, you know, it's crazy because I went on to have a career, as I said, in the in in the in the naughty. So from literally, I mean, 2000, 2001, 2002, I was with a very acquisitive PR agency group and, 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 and just bought companies. And then I left them. And from 2003 until 2010, I was the CFO of two companies listed on AIM, the alternative exchange market. So the right. kind of the junior market on the London Stock Exchange. Yeah. And during that time, I've raised over a hundred million pounds. And over my career, I've bought or sold I think it's now 23 companies ranging in size from the smallest one was half a million euros, which was also the best deal I ever did. I, I, I set that one out in my book. It's probably too long of a story to do here unless we end up with a lot of time at the end. But I've done deals in ranging in size from kind of half a million euros up to 22 million pounds. Um, wow. and, uh, and, and now basically I've taken that and distilled it in my book and I now do that in the world of entrepreneurial businesses. So I'm not raising as large sums of money, um, but I'm working on a deal right now with one client where we're looking to raise 10 million. Um, and so I'm typically doing stuff where it's raising between one and 10 million. Nice. And, um, and that's mainly in the UK or all over the world? Um, UK and Europe. Nice. Good. Well, I'm just typing, uh, replying to a couple of things here. Hello to Gaz and Nick uh, and everybody else watching on live online. If you do have a question, then please uh, feel free to ask it. And also uh, start a watch party. Let's share the Team Superdad Expert Hangout far and wide and we can bring uh, as much value to as many people as possible. So thanks for that introduction, David. Uh, Jason, good to have you on, sir. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, so uh, I basically decided at 21 that I wanted to be financially free, whatever that meant at the time. And being the engineer that I uh, that I was, I kind of put together a logical plan of um, replacing my income through 
kind of leveraged income systems, if you like, that didn't require an active uh, to, for me to be in a geographical space or reliant upon a, a boss, a partner, a parent, or um, or really just exchanging time for money. So a way that I could cover my living costs through those income systems and essentially I became a, a bit obsessed with with narrowing that time down from I originally had it at 20 years and I got it down to about three and a half in the end but it all stemmed back from very similar to David actually uh, I grew up on a on a council estate in South London and um, there was all kind of walks of life on that estate and there was kind of all different uh, personality types and every Friday everyone used to kind of congregate on these steps at the bottom of the estate and everyone would would complain about money and kind of how rich people have got it easy and and kind of all this you know they kind of had a really negative view towards money and then what was really fascinating is about half seven this guy called Roy would come down from the top flat and he would collect all their money and do a syndicate lottery and they'd spend the next half hour talking about how they'd spend the money and how great their life would be in it and and i was like i remember i was 13 and i don't I, like i never had it figured out or anything like that but i just remember thinking there's something not quite right because they've just kind of they've just kind of they're trying now to get something that they've just been moaning about for for half hour and anyway that that kind of stayed with me and then leading up to my 14th birthday i didn't have i did actually collect coins david but i, I would i wanted a bmx i wanted this mongoose bmx and Mac my wheels. birthday <laughs> yeah i had uh i wanted trick nuts and then a lot i had a gyro <laughs> and um and i wanted this bike so bad and, and my dad didn't earn a lot of money and he said look it was it was 209 pounds and he said like i'll give you a hundred if you raise the other hundred and we'll get it on your birthday my birthday was a six about six months away so i obviously shook his hand i didn't know how i was going to raise money i didn't I did, i'd never earned any money at that at that age but um, what I did is there was kind of this triangular green around the estate with all cars parked around it. And I thought, I'll just wash some cars. Anyway, I, I washed this first car. It took me all afternoon to wash this first car. And I was charging five pound, I got two pound tip. And then what happened is that night I went up to my bedroom, and my friend offered to help me. And I didn't really want to say yes, because I didn't want to pay him. I, I was, I thought at this rate, I'm going to get the bike in no time. And then my dad came in my room and he said, I'm going to the supermarket. Do you want anything? And something made me just give him the whole lot, like everything I'd earned that day to get another bucket and sponge. Yeah. And uh, the next day, my friends helped. And then we done four cars. And then by the end of the summer, I had four kids doing these cars. And I was just literally knocking at the doors and getting the money. And I, it clicked. I was like, this is it. Like if you use money the right way, it can actually leverage you out. It can, you can, you know, free you up of time so you can just do what you want to do and you can actually accelerate, you know, you can get more. And uh, it stayed with me for, you know, that was basically the, the first experience I'd had um, with, with that kind of investment, uh, investing money the right way. And then since then, I've, I've kind of developed businesses and I've, uh, I've, I've, I'm a professional investor and I'm a professional trader as well. So I, I've built a kind of well-rounded wealth creation system that is, that's, that's allowed me to essentially become financially free. Awesome. That is, and how old are you now? Uh, I'm 38 now, but I, I hit the kind of second figure at, uh, at 29. That was when I didn't require a, a boss or a job or anything anymore. Yeah. That is so inspiring. I mean, uh, and so not normal. Like, oh no, 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 not not, not normal. But it was, uh, it was. I don't know what it was. I, 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 when my son, when my first son was born, that's when it really shifted because I kept talking about it. And and when when my son was born, I I I wasn't ready for a son. You know, I was twenty two, twenty three, and uh, I, I made no you know, I didn't, I didn't pretend that I did either. I was just like, look, everyone knows my feelings. I'm not ready for this. I need to get my head around it. And I really just put the plan together then. It was kind of right. I'm going to now accelerate my savings. I'm going to invest passively. I'm going to do that. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to buy some stocks. I'm gonna, and I kind of had this big formula of how, if I got certain returns and I started at seven to 10% and I started at 15% and, I, and then I thought, oh, if I can increase my income by 10%, uh, that'll accelerate it down to about 10 years. And I started 
building a business. And then I thought, well, actually, when I built the business, I become so frustrated in the business because I was um, kind of abusing the business because I was I was literally just building the business so I could pay myself as much as possible. And then I and then I got very, very frustrated with low cash flow there. I was just looking at ways out. So I, I wanted to accelerate that last piece in the puzzle. And that's when I started looking at um, poker, online poker. I was looking at <laughs> options. And then I finally settled for, for the currency markets after losing a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of time and, and stress needs to go into uh, into poker. But th- this, I mean, just uh, straight away, you know, we had David's dad, doing something quite unconventional <laughs> like literally yeah. straight out yeah. of Mary Poppins that is except it didn't quite go to plan for 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 I forget what the dad was called in, in Mary Poppins but um uh, Mr Banks yeah, Mr. Banks. <laughs> yeah. he found um, it in the end yeah Maybe not the way it was planned but he found it in the end yeah exactly so why do you think that you know financial education you know is is not taught so much I, mean, I think it's obvious that you know parents can't pass on information they don't have you know you can i'm learning things with my kid now that i wish i had known when i was younger and together we're consciously learning it and i'm and i like meditation is, is a good example there right i'm i'm i'm, I'm taken on board the value of that and i'm sharing it with my kids as a way for them to um to grow and and and, and get through their, their this this crazy time um but I'm, I can't necessarily teach them about about money management and, and, and financial growth um, to the degree that you two can. So, so whose responsibility does it does it then become to teach our young people about about money, about making money? Oh, wow, <laughs> <laughs> that's a big question. So, okay. <laughs> so my my wife and both of my daughters are teachers, as I said earlier. So, my daughters are twenty seven and twenty nine. Yeah. Um, so my wife and both my daughters are teachers, and we often have very interesting family conversations around the education system. And we're all in reasonably broad agreement that the education system as it stands was designed at the time of the Industrial Revolution to teach people to be good factory workers. And it's really interesting because when you're in a, an education system like the school system and you know, you're, you're a cog in a wheel kind of thing, it's really hard to make an impact. But it's very interesting because my, my older daughter is moving up through the management ranks and she's now at kind of not quite senior management, but, 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 but one level down um, in, in a school. And my younger daughter, is just finishing her first year as a teacher. Um, But they're both kind of saying, there's something not quite right here. There's something that's just, it needs to be a little different. And, and, you know, and my older daughter is looking at it, she's a high school teacher, and she's looking at it from the angle of, we need to give these kids something more. We need to give these kids something different. And this whole infatuation on test results and league tables isn't helping. And my younger daughter who teaches year one, so like kids who are five and six, and she has this most wonderful expression. She says, I don't really care about what the education curriculum is. For my kids who are five and six years old, I want them to feel safe and I want them to feel loved. And if they feel those things, they will learn. And, 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 you know, I, it, it, it's not that they're trying to disrupt the system per se, but they're, they're looking at it and saying, there's something not quite right. And I'm going to do what I think feels right for my own bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and Jason, you're, you, 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 see, what you see, you talked about your boys, you've got more than one now, have you? Yeah, I've got two. Yeah. One's yeah. 15 and one is um, 12. Okay. But I, um, uh, so in, in your position where you're, uh, you're, educating adults through your through yeah. your wealth mastermind and stuff is, is, are you trickling that down to your to your boys or, or are they naturally looking at what you're doing and excited by it and want to learn yeah so one of my motivations for the plan that i put in place when i had my first son was a lot of it was motivated to be able to 
well, there's many things, but really one of the one of the biggest things was to give them or him at the time the time and space that he needs to not just have to go out and get a job to pay for some expenses and debts. I want it because the way that I what I realized was this. Not everyone wants to. Uh, well, you could you could ask a thousand people who wants to be financially free and everyone's hand would go up. OK, but you could then say how many people are and about 1% of their hands will go up. Yeah. And the truth is everyone's values dictates their actions. And, you know, there's some people that want six packs and there's some people, that, but, but they, they're not, they haven't got them. <laughs> and that's because it's not high enough up on their value system to actually put the work in and go and do it. So it's, so it's really the only, it's the minority that actually value financial independence that actually go and put all the work in to go and do it and it's really no difference to to losing weight is it it's just you burn less calories than you consume or you spend less than you earn and you invest wisely but it's only the people that really value and got a strong objective to achieve it that will achieve it and the rest of the people whilst it might be a nice idea they've got their own values and they're they're working on that so what i noticed was that when you when you can just focus on your highest values and you can just spend every day uh, this you know choosing what you do because you want to do it you naturally accumulate a decent income you just naturally you're guided into a place where you you require no motive or little motivation you you, you can take the hard times head on because you're you don't really see it as work so you've got that resilience you've you're, you've got that ambition in you to carry on so you can naturally produce a decent income so then my job then is to if they don't value wealth building it's to have a system in place so they don't have to think about it and i also want to have enough support and guidance for them so that they can find that place without having a fall in that trap of you know getting on the hamster wheel then buying keeping up with the joneses and and all the rest of it so uh, you know, really respecting your highest values and going after that will produce the income and then having a way, uh, just enough education so that you can manage what you bring in so that it kind of, it builds sustainable wealth instead of, you know, raising your lifestyle at the incorrect ratio. So, so on, on that point then, you know, people that struggle to manage their money well, um, there's, I guess there's two levels. There's the day-to-day -day management of money and then there's managing it in a way that you are growing it, investing, put, putting some aside, doing doing different things. Yeah, um, but it's only the people that really value it will figure out how that all fits together because other people will just search for one strategy like save 10% of your income. Well, that's not complete because if you save 10% of your income in 40 years of working, you've got four years income saved. That's not going to last you very long. So, so you need to look beyond in that. The bank, and then, in the bank earning half a percent a year. If you're lucky. Yeah, yeah, right. So it's not complete. Although that's a great strategy, it needs more to it. And then, and it's only the people that really value and are driven to achieve financial independence that will go the extra mile and figure out how it all fits together. Everyone else, they just need enough. They need enough guidance to have it automated, to not worry about it. And that includes, you know, things like, yeah, 10% of your income is great. But then if you accelerate your, your savings by another 10% or 10% of the 10% every three months, um, that's going to double your savings every two years. So that just that accelerated savings system is going to really accelerate your your run to financial independence and then on top of that you can start um you know investing in the markets and th and and funds and trying to beat the the inflation rate essentially and if you can do that you can't not be become financially independent you just can't not because you're paying yourself first and if you can accelerate your savings essentially you end up in a position where you're saving more than you're spending because when you get to the point of where you're saving 50% of your income, you know, that's that tipping point where you've got a real squeeze and control on your lifestyle costs and you've got the, you know, you're paying yourself more than, than what you're spending. And that's a real sweet place and Especially to be if you can do that early in your life so that you get the benefit of compound interest for 40, Absolutely. 60 yeah. years. Absolutely. Well, that's like for me and my kids. So, so here's some of my stuff. Right? I've, I've tried share trading, right? and tried it for about two years and came out about 1500 quid down but 
there was some highs and lows and it, ultimately the, the, the stress and strain of it has me like I've got to focus on on something di- different not so much I've got to focus on something different it's just like I've got to focus more on work it was taking up too much of my time and too much of my of my energy and ironically I'd paid to do some training and whilst I was doing the training I didn't have the money to trade and then sometime sometime down the line I had the money to trade but I wasn't really in any kind of structured program or any, really any support. So all I had was the broker flipping advising me or whatever, whatever I could <laughs> find online. So uh, it was a, it was definitely pretty haphazard. And then in a similar vein, I've got a uh, um, like a money box thing. So certain amounts of my money is, is, is going off into savings and I've set something up in a similar vein for the kids. So they've both got junior stocks and shares ISAs and I'm trying to teach them this is what can happen when you're investing in a company and why that's better than investing in, in, you know, I use like an example, like McDonald's, like you're going to go and buy a burger. Well, if you, what if you own a piece of the place, the place that place that you're, you're buying the burger from. So I think uh, at a basic level, like I said, I'm, I'm growing in my knowledge and trying to teach them at the same time. My kids are eight and eight and 10 at the moment, but um, it's, I guess it's quite a challenge. You know, maybe you could, you could answer some about this. I've really heard what you said there, Jason, about like what are people's motivations and values, um, and and the, the 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 determination of them to save or to be financially free will dictate their actions. And if it's just a nice to have, then then they're never gonna never really gonna get past that. What about people? And maybe you've got some experience in this first, David. What about people who, like myself, try to do things, but it kind of goes wrong and they get they get just derailed or, or or lack confidence um i think that around the subject of money obviously fear creeps in so like you're like well i bet it's better off doing nothing than risking it all and being worse off yeah it, and, and and it's fascinating um there are there are people in this world who have grown up in an environment where for whatever reason, as kids, they didn't have money. And the attitude of their parents was that money was evil. And people who had money were bad. Um, I, I have a friend who grew up in a very, very poor environment on a, on a very rough uh, council estate down in Kent. And um, his mom was a single mom and he was the oldest of four kids and basically the debt collectors used to come around every fortnight and rape his mother so his whole attitude of money is just completely messed up and and i mean i feel so deeply for him but he needs professional help but the problem is there are a lot of people who have grown up in a situation where for whatever reason there was this weird attitude towards money that either that money was evil or that people who had money were bad or, you know, and, 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 and it's not, it's not to say that there are some people who have money who are bad. Um, but, but even but, as well, um, like money is hard to get or money is risky. Yeah. yeah. All, all of, all of those kinds of things. And, 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 you know, when, when, when you're young and you're growing up in an environment and you're learning that as a child, um i mean it's 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 really interesting i mean there's there's members of my extended family one of my sister-in-laws um i I don't know the detail of her upbringing but i know that debt was a major problem in her life because um every time she or her husband uh get into debt she gets like mega stressed even even if it's debt where they're saying well we're gonna we're gonna borrow some money and buy an asset that's going to generate us a future income or we're going to borrow some money and buy a, a second home or a buy to let kind of thing. She just, the whole idea of being in debt is so stressful to her. And it's really interesting right now with the, um, with the coronavirus stuff going on. So the, the UK government has two, two programs that are based around debt. One of which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and the other one, which is pretty good, but it's a little bit of hard work. So they've got this bounce back loan scheme that if you have a business, they'll lend you up to 25% of last year's turnover with no personal guarantees, with a two and a half percent interest rate, no repayments, no interest charge for the first year. And it's like, oh my God, here's an opportunity. So let's say you've got, it's, it's capped at 50 grand. So if you've got a business that turns over 
a hundred grand, you can get 25. If you've got yeah. a business that turns over 200 grand, you can get 50. You can't get more than 50. But literally, that's 50 grand of money that you can look at and say, okay, what can I invest in my business? What, what could I do that under normal circumstances, I wouldn't want to do, but it might be that, hey, I want to create a new online program and, you know, Kajabi is quite expensive, but all of a sudden here's some money that I can put to it. Or I want to create a, a marketing program built around a scorecard and some Facebook ads and, and all of this stuff that's designed to generate future business. And here's the government saying, here's some cash, come and get it. And there's no personal guarantees. There's no payments for the first 12 months. And after that, the interest rate is only two and a half percent. It's like it's almost free money. Yeah. But a lot of people are still, oh, my God, I can't do this. And I actually did a blog post 10 days ago that said and the, 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 the title of the blog post was I hate debt. I hate the idea of being in debt. Should I take one of these government loans? And my unequivocal advice to people, if you're running a business is, yes, take it. Even if you just take it and pay it back in 12 months because you didn't need it. Yeah, yeah. What an amazing opportunity to have something, you know, don't take it and think, oh, well, I'll, I'll just, you know, my business is tanking. So I'll just pay myself a salary for 12 months and then I'll be in debt at the end and it, it'll all be horrible. No, take it and invest it in your business. Create some assets, create something that's going to generate future income. Yeah. I'd like so, to, so, I'd like to say as well, yeah, just, just, just by having, right. So if you just got that loan, like David said, and sat it in your bank, there will be a return on investment just from your mentality and the way that you do business, because yeah. you'll be relieved, you'll have no worries, and you'll say, right, that's there. It kind of eases the animal brain, and then you just go out with more care, more love to your clients. You can solve problems better. And I, I, I use the example, right? If I was a if I was a builder and I'd done some work on your house and I didn't have any savings, like I did, I had no buffer whatsoever. And you rang me up and said, oh, look, we've snagged some of your work and I was desperate for the payment. The chances are I'm going to come around and I'm going to be quite agitated, aggressive, yeah. almost, oh, what, you know, kind of querying your, your snags and you're not going to pay me the whole amount. You probably won't ever work with me again. And you definitely won't recommend me to your friends. However, yeah. if I had six months living costs in the bank and I knew that I was going to be all right for six months and you rang me up, I'd be like, don't worry. I'm going to come around. I'm going to make sure that this is the perfect, like, you're very happy with this. I, I want to keep a workflow going with you. I want to keep a relationship going. You're thinking differently just by having cash there. Yeah. And you're going to recommend me to your friends. I'm going to be, you know, working for all your friends. I'm going to be, have more work than I can handle so I can charge more. And uh, it's just, there's a return on investment just from having a buffer of cash. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I'm, I bank with Metro bank and I don't know what they're up to, but they've, they're trying to, they've got to create some technical thing to get, uh, to get approved by the government. So so they, they've got the, the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, which is the bigger loan. Yeah. A bit harder work, but bigger amounts of money. They've got that, but the bounce back loan they don't have yet. Yeah. I'm yeah. waiting. <laughs> yeah. So I'm all in. Um, and just briefly on this point, because it's such, it's such, such valid advice, but on the subject of that risk, like that concern, because I think this, this applies to personal savings and investments or business savings and investments. Someone who finds themselves uncomfortable about the whole idea um and yet you've got two experts here to both you know both saying you know um look if it's a sensible investment if it's well planned out then then of course you would you would want to do it is there any tips that you can suggest for i don't know it could be a husband and wife or it could be a, a business uh, a partnership what, what can they do to break through some of those some of that resistance some of that fear is there any practical tips that, that, that can help them um I don't know. Is it, is it about planning? Is it about getting excited? Is it about finding a way to relieve, you know, to, to remove the fear? What, 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 what can stop that block? David? Open dialogue. So if you're in a, if you're in a situation where you've got a partner or a fellow shareholder or, or, or whatever, um, yeah, have an open discussion and, 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 and talk to people. And, and even if, you know, even if you don't, if you're a, if you're a, a, a sole shareholder in a business, but you're in a long-term relationship, speak to your partner or your spouse and just sit down and say, 
hey, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this. So, you know, the government's got this new program and, and I, know you're, I know you're not always comfortable with debt, but I'm, I'm looking at doing this and this is what my idea is and this is what my plan is. And, you know, again, it's really interesting. And this is very much from a personal perspective. When I, you know, I was, I was in kind of corporate careers for a while and then I was with PLCs and stuff. I've, I've run my own business for 10 years now. And, and when I first started out, I remember thinking, well, my wife's a teacher. She doesn't know anything about business. And then all of a sudden I found myself in a spot of bother and I thought, oh no, I really ought to tell my wife. And I sat down and we started talking about it. And it was like, she had a lot of common sense. You know, she, she might not come from a business background but she really understood from a common sense perspective. And now whenever I'm looking at a situation where I'm thinking, you know, I wanna do something different in my business. I might wanna invest something. I might wanna develop something. I might wanna hire someone new. I sit down and I talk to my wife about it. and. If I can convince her that it's a good thing, then it must be a good thing. Yeah. So you need to get some clarity in your mind to be able to take into that conversation so that you can speak confidently, um, but also so that you could, I guess, answer any concerns, but also be vulnerable and share some of your own concerns. So that is, that is the nature of open dialogue. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. And be willing to share that and, you know, and be willing to say, look, I, you know, I want to take on this bounce back loan and it's 50 grand and here's, you know, here's what the payments are. And, you know, maybe what we'll do is we'll put half of it into a savings account. So that's safe. And I'm going to invest the other half and we'll, we'll see what the return comes from that. And if that's good, then we can spend more. But if it's not so good, then, you know, we've got a bit of a buffer type of thing, but just having that open dialogue with, you know, whomever is your key partner in life, in business, in whatever, but, you know, just, just to have the ability to kind of share that with someone else and, and, and get their perspective and, and, you know, because sometimes when, you know, when you're running your own business, it can be really, really lonely. And just mm. to have someone that you can share it with and get their perspective on, even if they don't agree with you, at least to yeah. have a dialogue going. Yeah, That's, I, I, I would agree with Dave, definitely. And uh, a great, a great thing with that as well is um, having someone who's non-biased and will kind of ground your ideas is crucial because what a lot of people might do with this money is try to fix something that's broken. So their business hasn't withstood. They, they need the money because their business has, it, there's something wrong with their business. that It yeah. won't last through this pandemic, uh, which is why they might be considering a loan or something's not quite right with their business. What won't work is if you try and just ride it out and patch up some bits until we get through it averages and i'm seeing okay it's it's usually a four year from start to finish on average uh if you take out the great depression because that skews it slightly and then it's about a 10 or 11 month recovery period from the bottom to uh the the previous high so what i'm looking at doing is saving the money that i saved when we were above the, the mean and then i divide it up evenly and put it into a 10 month deposit uh round about you know in about three months time i'll be looking to deploy that and I'll essentially buying more more and more and more whilst we're low so that when we get up to break even i'm in profit and i'm not doing what some of these fund managers are, are saying and saying just sit it out you know it'll be all right and spending four years to get back to break even so the opportunity is there for that as well yeah and that's i mean i understand what you've just said um and then there's the practical sort of application side of it for me, which would be like, okay, that's, there's a, that's not something that I know how to do. Do people, do they go and get a, do they go and, do they join Moneybox or do they go on a, on a, on a course with you to learn these things? Or like where <laughs> there's, you know, or there's, there's hundreds of share trading courses out there, isn't there? And, and you know, people can, people can be like, oh yeah, I'm going to go and learn how to do that. Spend two grand learning a course. And, and, and it's, <clears> it's, quite a technical weekend where you don't really understand what, what you've just learned what, what, what's a, what's a step someone could do to um i guess get on that path of, of, of being an investor so when i'm talking about investing in the market i'm talking about investing in the whole market so what i was just talking about is the most passive way to invest for you for an index fund yeah. and um if you depending on the the kind of long-term mean that you're looking at and the strategy that you've got to invest in uh, will dictate your returns. Now, if you're using a 50-year average growth of the market, I'm looking at about a 7 to 10% return from 
a fund like the S&P 500, about seven and a half percent for me. Some of the people who are looking at a shorter term mean and and have a different strategy, they get anything up to about a 10 percent return. Yeah. Now, the great thing about investing in a fund like that is you are you're it's, you're diversifying different types of risk. So first of all, company risk. You're not putting all your eggs in one company. You're essentially buying bits of the 500 top performing companies in the world. Um, then you're not risk uh, at sector because you're in all these different sectors as well. So you're not putting all your eggs in three technology companies. You're buying 500 companies with about 70 or 80 different sectors. Yeah. So there's that. And then the last thing is time risk. And the way you overcome that, like trying to time the bottom or time the market is literally buy frequently. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Benjamin Graham. He was Warren Buffett's mentor, but he says, you want to buy your stocks like groceries, not perfume. And what he means by that okay, is yeah, yeah. when you go shopping, you don't stop going shopping and you buy everything every single week every single week whereas perfume you're a bit picky you know there's different times between buying one and yeah. and you're going to come unstuck so there's something called dollar cost averaging or pound cost averaging and that's where you just buy frequently at regular intervals every single month and then finally you just want to automate it so that you remove all human emotion from the whole process and that's called paying yourself first as far as i'm concerned yeah literally just siphoning it off automatically without having to think about it Right. So, and so in, in, in simple, making that even simpler, that's like what, like putting 50 quid a month or 500 quid a month, depending on where you're at into, I'm going to buy 50, I'm going to buy 50 lots of the S and P 500 this month. And I'm going to do the same again next month and next month and next month. That is that, is that in kind simple? of, you know, we, we don't have time to discuss the difference between mutual no, no, funds and, and ETFs, but there's yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> essentially, yes, you're, you're just instructing, a, a, uh, a vanguard or someone like that to to buy a certain amount of shares of uh, of, of the fund yeah unless you happen to be a geek like me who likes to pick stocks yeah well that's the, that's the next level for me personally yeah. so I, I go passive then I do stocks then I do speculation which is currencies yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. now when I was when I was dabbling as I, as I kind of was I, I I had my most interest in the Nasdaq because with my digital marketing background, they're tech, tech companies that I felt I understood. And actually when I was doing a little bit of research or reading what Tesla was up to or Twitter or some of it, I knew what they were up to and other parts I was just interested in finding out about it. So um, uh, that, that was, that not only gave me a level of interest, um, but I also gave me a level of confidence as, as, as well. Yeah. And in terms of, um spending money you know because there's there's i i feel like it's important in in having an abundant life is to also enjoy our money where where do people make mistakes the biggest mistake is spending more than you have which i guess comes back to actually not keeping a track of our money as well but you know what what if anything would you say to people about enjoying their money <laughs> So I'm 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 a hedonist, um, and I I like spending money on travel. Um, so I, I grew up in Canada, and I go back to Canada every summer. I I don't know if I'll make it back this summer with lockdowns and quarantines and all that, but yeah. but um, so we go back, and it's you know it's a nine and a half hour flight from London to Vancouver. Um, and when I was in corporate world, I started traveling business class and I've decided that that's something that for me is worth spending money on. Yes, it's a hell of a lot more expensive, but for me, the holiday begins when the cab picks me up at home as, to, as opposed to the holiday begins after I've endured nine and a half horrible <laughs> hours in some aluminum tube. Yeah. And that's one of those things that for me, yeah, I, I, that 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 to me is just something that I really appreciate. That um, I also really like good wine, and I have studied wine and learned about wine. I ran a wine business for a while that 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 wasn't very successful, but it was good fun. Um, but you know, I I I've learned to appreciate. You know, what does a 50 pound or 100 pound bottle of wine taste like? And no, I don't drink them all the time. But my God, when I drink them, I sure enjoy them. Yeah. 
And is there an element of values in there? Like just being true to yourself, making sure that you're enjoying life or, or you know, like the, the holiday example is good because yeah. um, uh, if it takes a day to recover from a flight, you've actually lost a day of holiday, not exactly. gained a day of holiday. Exactly. But you know, my, my, get, my dad, getting to the heart of that, is that about, is that about tuning into your values? And, and yes, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. And, 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 you know, this is a dad's podcast and my dad is so sadly no longer with us, but my dad used to talk about the finer things in life. And, and to me, flying business class and drinking good wine are the finer things in life. And there are other things too, but, you know, but, but those are, those are two things, you know, if, you, if, if, if someone came along and said, you know, David, I need you to cut, X amount of money out of your out of your expenditure base because whatever has happened, well, I would probably cut those ones because I accept completely that that that's that's an entirely discretionary spend, but it's a spend that I'm in a position where I'm grateful that I can make the choice to spend it. Yeah, but they can easily flip that back so they become quite a motivational goal to put back in as very much so, very much so. Yes, and 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 it's interesting when I when I left my corporate. Uh, world and moved into into running my own business and for the first few years it was really really tough and it was like you know flying in the back of the bus and I was just thinking oh god I just I I, I I'm you know and it was a motivational thing to say no no I, I I'm now you know I now got on the plane and turned left and not right and I don't <laughs> yes. I don't mean I don't mean that to sound like big-headed or egotistical but it's just that's one of the things that to me that's something that's of value no I, I get that and some people will wear 300 pound pairs of jeans or have a 10,000 you know, pound watch, whereas others won't. And I, th I think it is about tuning into values and setting the bar for ourselves in our life. Uh, because if we don't, then what are we striving for? Well, you know, I, I mean, as, 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 as Jason said, you know, we're human beings. We're the, only, we're the only species on this planet who give a toss about money. And, and we're born without any. I mean, unless you happen to inherit something, but in principle, we're born without any. And when we die, we don't take it with us. Yeah. So, you know, so crazy, yeah. my, 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 and I agree 100 percent with Jason. Money is a tool that human beings designed to facilitate commerce. That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. And so one, Jason, one, thing I, one thing I would add is just like. So there are things you can do if you if you value travel and you want to kind of upgrade flights like David said and things like that. Um, there are ways that you can use leverage to do that, like a, like a credit card with points. Right. But you have to have absolute fiscal discipline to not see the credit card as means to spend money you didn't have because it's, yeah. it completely eradicates the whole thing. It's pointless. Yeah. And what, how you should see a credit card if you've got one is you just, you see it as a middleman. You don't spend anything on it unless you've got the money in the bank to literally just pay it straight away. Yeah. So, so it's kind of a middleman to accumulate points so you can do these upgrades. And, and I, I personally find that the, the uh, not first class, but the business class is where the value is because yes. I think yeah. like business class is like twice as much. And then first class is like twice that. And yep. it's not twice as better, if you know what I mean. It, so it's like, it's, so I've, I've been upgraded to first a few times and I've done a few deals with on points. First class is very nice, but, but not twice I would, as better. I would, I would, I would never, it, it, I would never spend the money to buy a first class ticket no. as I will spend the money to buy a business class ticket. Right. And the other thing is, if you're um, a, a, a very wise rule to go by is net, if you're everyone should be saving, in my opinion. Right. It's very wise to save. And a, a great rule to go by is never increase your monthly expenses unless you can increase your savings by the exact same amount. And that way you can scale your lifestyle without without sacrificing your liquidity and your wealth building. So uh, if, you, if you're going to get, a, you can upgrade a car from 300 to 600, don't go and do that unless you can put another 300 into your savings every month. So you essentially have to yeah. raise 600 a month yeah. to, to scale your lifestyle without feeling like you're on a treadmill. Yeah. And well, put, it into your, put it into your pension rather than into a savings account because you get the tax benefit as well. Yeah, and, or, and it forces you to leave it in there for longer. I love yep. that. That's um, and that's just a real simple advice. The old uh, you mentioned before about the ten percent savings. Is it is it millionaire mindset where you put ten percent into saving, ten percent into a saving, twenty percent into a uh, save long term saving? Yeah, uh, there's very. I think T. Harvecker uh, 
does something like that. And I yeah. think there's a, who, what's the book? Profit First, um, yeah. similar business models like that. But uh, there's all ways of doing it. I essentially stick to just three. So I do my savings, which then filters down into investments after I've got a buffer of cash. I do self-development because that's got an intangible income growth aspect to it. And then, um, and then just my living costs and that's it. And I find that that, that works for me. Well, that's a perfect way to sort of bring us towards the close. Um, and I kind of want to circle back right to the beginning. What, in terms of managing money well, what, what are the basics that someone should be doing on a week to week? You know, should, is it an income and expenditure, a tracking expenses, like to, to, to how, you know, someone who's on top of their money, because I think you have to be on top of it before you can even, before you can really master it. What, what would be the telltale signs of someone not being in control of their money? And, you know, so, so what, what, what's, what structure should they put in place to, to start getting a better control over their finances? You go first, Jason. Okay. Uh, first thing I would do is uh, the first thing that I would suggest is stop the bleeding. And what I mean by that is go and see where the leaks are in your bucket. Because most people have a bucket and they have income coming into one bucket and it all goes out, so, some crack in the bucket and they don't know where it's all going. So the best thing you can do is go and track how you're spending your money and print out 12 months bank statements so that you capture all of those one-offs like the MOT and the, the hair and the wedding dress and all this yeah. kind of stuff, average it out over 12 months and then really kind of see how you can make, cut those things down. So like literally flag up any hotspots. If the gardener was costing 40 pound a week and you didn't realize, well, that's, that's a fair chunk. And it's like, uh, if you've got a few of those, I call it death by a thousand cuts. You can just get rid of some of that stuff. And then what I, what I would advise to do is pretend you're still spending it, but stick it in savings instead. So literally just keep spending it and that will force you to raise your income and, um, you know, get more creative over finding new ways to earn money. But instead of paying the flipping, uh, you know, the grass, <laughs> you're, you're paying your, your, purpose account your financial yeah. freedom account yeah something that's, it's like a fitness thing it's, it's just putting slowly but surely putting more weights on to to, to to get stronger basically yeah well essentially you've got a, an account that's forever going up in yeah. the background there's there's a wonderful quote from charles dickens um i think it's david copperfield and the, the character is mr Macabre, and and the quote goes um Annual income, 20 pounds, no, 20, sorry, no, month, sorry, monthly income, 20 shillings. Monthly outgoings, 19 shillings and sixpence, result, happiness. Monthly outgoings, 20 shillings and sixpence, result, misery. So the key message there is, you know, and, and, and I know that's all pounds, shillings and pence yeah, yeah. and that, but, but the key message is, Whatever your income is, live within it. And, and it's, it's, it's scary to see people who, and the financial services industry makes a fortune out of them, but people who kind of, you know, they spend beyond their means and they rack up credit card debt. And all of a sudden, you know, you got credit card debt where you're paying 25 or 30% APR interest rates. And, and, you know, oh, well, it's fine because I only have to pay off £10 a month. Well, yeah, you might only be paying £10 a month, but the interest charge is 35 So your debt's growing and growing and growing, and you're never going to get out of that. Mm. So I, I, I would say my first advice would always be whatever your income is, learn to live within that. And if you want to live beyond that, figure out ways to grow your income. Don't get into... And, and that comes back to my earlier point about the debt and the whole thing about, you know, the, 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 the bounce back loans and the Sybil's loans. Don't get into debt simply to cover the fact that you've got right. a deficit. De debt is a wonderful tool that enables you to buy an asset to create a future income stream. But yeah. don't live beyond your means. So, so if, you know, if, if you're out there in the world today and your income is 30 grand, and your outgoings are 32 grand, you got to figure out pretty quickly how to cut at least two grand and ideally five grand off of your expenditure base. And it might be tough in the short term, or you got to find a way to increase your income. Yeah. But having control will make you, first of all, 
realize where you're at, but then push you forward. And I really, I, that Copperfield's uh, point as well is that the stress of being in debt is actually disabling yes. um, and far better to have a plan in place and motivate yourself towards growth. Yes. Yep. That's Absolutely brilliant, guys. Wrap it up. We're um, uh, hitting nine o'clock. So thank you so much for, for your time. Pleasure. The expert hangout happens every Monday night and uh, we pick a subject from within the team super dad F5 that is focus, fitness, finance, family, and fun. Tonight has been about money and making money magic. Uh, David, what, what can people do to connect with you or see some of your, uh, you, you know, get hold of your book or, or check out? Yeah. Some, what so uh, the easiest way to reach out to me is on my website, which is addthenmultiply.com. Um, or if people want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, it's David B. Horn, H-O-R-N-E. Great. Thank you. I've got your book, David. Very good. Thank you. And Jason, tell us a little bit about your programs and where people can get hold of you. Yeah, look, I just, uh, all I'll promote is my podcast. Um, yeah. uh, if you go and listen to my podcast, Always Free, it's called, and uh, you'll hear all about all the strategies and stuff that I implemented from 21 right up to today. So uh, go and listen to that. I won't promote any programs. No, I've listened to your, I listened to about four episodes today, actually. Uh, great production values, um, really good guests um, and definitely a lot of knowledge to be had in there. So yeah, I definitely recommend uh, Jason's podcast. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, if you've just watched this, then brilliant. If you're watching on the replay, then equally thank you for coming and finding us. Um, if you go over to teamsuperdad.com forward slash expert, you'll get yourself on the list to be reminded of when these are coming up and to get any uh, bonuses, additional content or the replay that any of our guests might give us. So all that leads me to do is thank you both for being on the uh, expert hangout tonight thank you to everyone that's watched Pleasure. and we'll thanks, see you Johnny. next week take care thanks a lot cheers, cheers guys thanks stop that in the live stream